I wanted to start with um, with the story of how you met Meyerowitz because he was uh, the, the means by which you became introduced to this entire world of photography right. that sort right. of changed your life. Yeah. Tell us about that and, okay. and what he showed you that made such an impression on you. Sure, because uh, he showed me something the first time I met him that knocked me out. Uh, I was living in New York. I had gotten a PhD in English and was teaching at Brooklyn College. Um, where, by the way, I knew Noah Baumbach when he was like six years old uh -huh. because his father taught film at Brooklyn College with me. Anyway, um, I, and I lived on the Upper West Side in a rent-controlled apartment, and this was in the 70s, the, the worst decade in New York's history. The city almost went bankrupt, crime in the streets, graffiti everywhere. It was wonderful to live there. And the <laughs> Upper West Side was like a little village. Uh, where if you needed to know somebody, even if you didn't know you needed to know them, somebody would introduce you. I knew a painter who, I lived on 103rd and Riverside, I knew a painter who lived on 100th and Riverside, and he knew this photographer named Joel Meyerowitz who lived on 100 and West End. And so he, when we were taught, we, the painter and I became friends, and we were, would have dinners together, we both had kids about the same age, it was one of those kind of arrangements. And uh, things I said about movies and my interest in the movies, which I, as I say, I was a film critic. I was a working film critic at the time. I was president of the National Society of Film Critics in the mid-1970s. Uh, Pauline Kael nominated me for that because I wrote a f weekly film column for, for Commonweal Magazine. Anyway, I had had some conversations <coughs> with this friend about uh, filmmaking. He said, you know, there's a photographer who's also interested in filmmaking. You ought to meet him. I think you and he would get along. I said, okay. So he arranged for me to go and meet this guy named Joel Meyerowitz at his apartment. Joel, Bruce Davidson lived a couple of blocks away. The, the Upper West Side was full of uh, photographers uh, who had rent-controlled apartments because these old apartment uh, buildings usually had a kind of utility, even sort of laundry room, and you could make the, the, these photographers all made wooden sinks to fit in the space and then covered them with plyofilm to make them watertight. And they had a dark room. So I went to see Joel one afternoon, um, and he was working in the darkroom when I got there. And when, he, when I arrived, he said, glad to meet you, and so forth. He said, I'm working, I'll be another maybe 20, 30 minutes. See, look at this while you're waiting. And he dumped this book on my lap. It was a book called The Americans by somebody I'd never heard of named Robert Frank, even though he was a, you know, I realized very quickly that he was an important filmmaker to him. Um, and by the time Joel... Uh, came out of the darkroom, I was jumping up and down. I said, this book is a paper movie. It's one of the most astounding movies I've ever seen. Uh, and that was, the, that was the link that got us together and talking about taking two different views, having a dialectic from <laughs> my background as an historian and so forth and so on, and his as a, as a working artist. And that day he showed you some of his own prints that he had been working yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, from the beginning, he was making these beautiful uh, prints um, and it was just in the period when he was, had the view camera was going up to the Cape and what he, how he was photographing and what he was photographing was beginning to change in dramatic ways. But most of what we looked at were uh, gelatin silver prints of work he'd been doing since the 60s uh, as a street photographer in New York. I mean, a lot of it, the first stuff I probably looked at was a lot of stuff shot in our neighborhood, you know, Broadway and stuff like that. But then the whole, I began to get the whole scope of his work. And he had a dummy for a book <coughs> um, called Still Going uh, that he was sort of putting together that never came to fruition then, although it got incorporated into the big five double two-volume thing that was done on him a few years ago. Um, but we looked at that book, and I learned a lot about sequencing images from looking at his stuff. Uh, and looking at the way that he played with pictures and played off pictures against each other. <coughs> and, you know, at some point he said to me, you know, in introducing me to the whole concept of street photography, which I'd, I never thought about what genres were in photography. You know, I looked at photographs and I went to photographic exhibitions, but I'd never thought about it in a sort of categorical way. He said, you know, this kind of photography, uh, which I do and I love and I know has a complex and interesting history, you know, nobody's ever written about it or anything. And so we got this idea that the two of us might do this together. And we applied for an NEH grant um, and got it. 
and that paid for the, the initial research trips, including a trip to Paris and so forth and so on. And the thing was rolling. And then <clears throat> around the time I was beginning to write it, I uh, serendipitously got offered a curatorship. I mean, I, again, I'd never worked in a museum. I'd never had an art history course in my life. So the idea that I would work at a place like the Art Institute of Chicago never occurred to me. Yeah. But they were looking for somebody to teach the history of photography at the School of the Art Institute one year, and they hired me for that. And then the museum grabbed me and made me a curator. And that delayed the book for a couple of years. I want, I want to talk about the book, but yeah. I think that you said something really interesting. Mm -hmm. That when you first took a look at uh, Robert Frank's book and right. Meyerowitz's book, right. that you talked about that this is a movie. Mm -hmm. and did you feel then and do you feel now that the that there's an aspect of storytelling that applies to really great street photography or I'm not sure I'd call it storytelling there's a narrative there but it's a, it's a formal narrative and how one picture moves to another and often it works best when you jump from one location or time frame to another as you go through the pictures and this is something that, that when we first started planning the book, the, the Little Brown, uh, Janet Bush, who was the, the, the uh, head of a division of Little Brown, was very responsive to the idea of the book. And she made a commitment to us early on. And then there was this delay. And still, they stuck with us. Um, but Joel uh, did a lot of the sequencing of the pictures in that book. And that's what taught me from the beginning that when I do a book, I should be involved in the sequencing, if not in total control of it. And that's how we come together with this Chuck Close book I did, where I got to do it all. Joel always wanted Bystander to begin with a run of pictures before you even got to the title page. From between the half title and the title, as I recall, was the way we did it. And he sequenced pulling pictures from the whole history, and not in chronological order, but putting them together so that as you look from this one to that one and then turn the page, even though there might be a huge time jump, a completely different kind of camera and a different country and a different culture, you would have a sense of visual flow of how being in the street with a camera has certain parameters, imaginative parameters, that as different as one picture may seem from another are all part of the same mental and imaginative universe. And that's what I learned from that first run of pictures mm -hmm. he did. And I've learned how to apply it in my own books. And when I was at the Art Institute and brought Irving Penn's archives there, uh, even though a completely different kind of photography, I did the same thing. That's I, what I learned about placing pictures together. There are three ways to write an essay. One is with words. Another is with an exhibition and how you sequence pictures on the wall. And that's completely different from how you sequence them in a book, where you go to one to two to one to two in a certain order. When you guys sat down and, and envisioned this book, what was the idea behind it? Because it's as, it's as much about the history of photography as it is about the genre of photography we've come to mm -hmm. call street photography. Mm -hmm. But when you guys sat down and started talking about what you wanted to do, you know, what was that initial germ? Well, the, the germ was, for Joel, the, the history of photography was street photography. That's what predominated. That's what defined photography. He had been an advertising art director uh, originally. <clears throat> and he always loved lunchtime because he could go out and walk around the streets. And the more he did that, the more he became dissatisfied with going back to the office. And at one point, he was young. He didn't have kids. He was married, but he didn't have kids. He had a rent control department already. This was around, I think, 62 or 63. He just quit. And the guy I was working for was so sort of infatuated with him that the guy gave him his first 35 millimeter camera because he wanted to go out and take, you know, walk around the streets and have a camera to take pictures because he loved street life. He'd grown up in the Bronx. <coughs> he lived in Manhattan. He was, uh, was, <coughs> was completely infatuated with it. So, the history of photography was the history of street photography as the center of it. And for me, because I started from the same place, because it was his work and then the, the other work by people who did this kind of photography, that to me was the center of the universe of photography. And everything I've learned since has been expanding out from the, that drop that hit the pond <clears throat> for me. It's all concentric circles. So even when I was working with Penn. Penn had a period early on in his career 
after he'd studied with Alexei Brodovich at the uh, Philadelphia School of Industrial Arts, when he did street photography. Not a very interesting street photographer, um, but even that was a bit of a toehold in Penn's career for me from which I could start, and it never became the predominant thing. I didn't try and make him into a street photographer in the way I presented him. He was a studio photographer. But my whole sense of what's cap possible in photography, and again, how you express that, not only in words, but crucially, centrally, in sequences of pictures, how you somebody hands you a box with 100 pictures in it, go through them, go through them with the photographer who made them, see what sense they make as you change the order, how they relate one to another. So, so having worked on this book and all the work that you've done subsequently, yeah. um, have you come up with a, a definition for what street photography is? Yeah, my basic definition, uh, which is the broadest possible one and doesn't have a, a real aesthetic judgment linked into it, is it's pictures of everyday life in the street. If there's any emphasis there that, def that separates it from all other forms of photography, it's everyday life. You know, it's not, it's, it, it, in the hands of someone like Cartier-Bresson, all kinds of pictures got published in Life magazine that were about everyday life in the street. It, you know, it was an event. It was, it was something that was newsworthy. But it's not about a response to a news event. Um, it's interesting. I'll give you an example of, of uh, the crossover between it's kind of working on assignment as a photojournalist and, and a street photography. Gary Winogrand did a lot of stuff for Coronet magazines like that uh, in his early days. And he covered political conventions. He, 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 he covered the, uh, I think, 1950, it must have been the 56 election, uh, uh, presidential election with Nixon and Eisenhower. And then he covered uh, up through the McCarthy, the, the Gene McCarthy era in the mid-60s, he covered political things. And while all the other photographers were elbowing each other out of the way to get a clean shot of the candidates, the most interesting and most crucial pictures that Winogrand took were ones where he purposely stood back and caught glimpses of the candidates through the tangle of arms and through the tangle of cables and, and TV cameras and everything else that was a screen between the two. He stepped back as if he were some bystander taking a picture of a news event rather than someone who was participating in and covering the news event. Yeah. And that's, again, that, that stepping back, we think of Winogrand as a very aggressive street photographer, which he is, but in a real sense, from the original commercial work he did or the, the professional work he did as a kind of photojournalist, it was a stepping back that allowed him to see life as a street photographer rather than a pushing forward, yeah, even I, though then he would push forward in the streets. What's, what's interesting is that I completely agree with this idea. It's capturing the ordinary. But there's something about really great street photography that elevates that and makes it extraordinary. Right. You've described it as the theater of the street. Yeah. So how do you sort of combine that idea that it is documenting ordinary behavior, ordinary mm -hmm. activity, but it somehow has the flair of the theatric to it. So when you take a look at the photograph, mm -hmm. you have a mm -hmm. unique mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost a joke. There's a one word answer to that. Timing, <laughs> 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 you know, as they used to say in the advertising business or whatever. Yeah, it's, you know, it's the, it's the ability that certain photographers have to, um, to slow down time and see in what are gaps to other people looking at what's going by on the street, see the way two things eclipse each other or, or play off of each other or contradict each other, and to get into those in-between moments and take a picture of them, moments that the rest of us just don't quite see. It, it's uh, a, a, an interesting recent uh, uh, sort of a, a takeoff on street photography was a wonderful show that was done at the Met two years ago, I think now, by a, a painter named James Neris called Street. Um, and Neris's own contribution was it, to it was that he drove a car around New York near the curb and shot a, a 
very fast, very accelerated video out a car window. So it was kind of a takeoff on Google, on the Google Street View stuff, except that he wasn't up on the roof and you know he was just in the car window at street level. And by shooting very fast video, then he did an installation of this work that was the core of this show called Street, um, in which he slowed down the video to slow motion. And what happens is that you see this sort of mirage of people walking down the street going by that's balletic and beautiful. And you also see what the street photographer sees in real time, which is these little collisions, these little funny juxtapositions of a gesture by one person and a smirk by somebody else or something in the background against something in the foreground. The two elements not being aware mm -hmm. of each other, but, being a, but the photographer seeing an awareness of relationship between them. So this video was a kind of an essay on street photography. And the rest of the show, he collaborated with Doug Eklund, who is a curator at, at uh, the Met of photography. And they brought work out going back to Assyrian times and coming up to current street photography that showed mm -hmm. people depicting life in the street long before cameras were invented, but also since represented in the sense. It was a wonderful show. Wow. Could it took the idea of street photography and again said something that we've lost a bit of track of uh, in the last couple, few decades, which is the extent to which the idea of seeing everyday life in the street is essential to the whole history of art. It is a central subject of the entire history of art that street photography it was, in a way, has been the ultimate fulfillment of. There was a, a, a film that you did uh, where you followed Joel on the streets of New York. Yeah. And yeah. That's something I've watched a countless number of times. <laughs> I, I never get tired of seeing it. Yeah. Uh, but how did observing him mm -hmm. teach you and make you aware of just what you were talking about? Oh, sure, because the, the, the most, in many ways, the most extraordinary thing going on when a street photograph is made, uh, the, the, the thing that if you were standing there, you see and respond to is you don't see what the photographer saw because he's got this kind of hypervision that you don't. You won't see that until he shows you the print. But what you do see is the way in which a great street photographer can insinuate himself into a crowd like a wisp of smoke going through a wall, a chink in a wall. Nobody else particularly sees he's there, and yet he's you know, infiltrating the whole thing in this extraordinary way and making pictures. And it, you're looking at him if you're standing back, but the people he's photographing aren't looking at him. They're often not aware that he's there. Now, as I say, Winogrand liked to reverse that. Sometimes he perfect, purposely confronted people, and there are situations mm -hmm. where the photographer jumps in or jumps at the subject. But uh, the wonderful thing about being out on the street with Joel, and that bonded me to, you know, my fascination and my... A relationship, my f growing friendship with him was to watch him in action. Street photographers, and I also walked on the streets, he was an old age at the time, but I had a remarkable experience of being on the street with Henri Cartier-Bresson and a bunch of other people uh -huh. from Magnum, including Kudelka, uh, once in the late 70s, because I was with Joel. I mean, I was nobody, but Joel was already uh, someone that Cartier-Bresson knew, and he had us to his apartment and so forth. Um, and uh, Cartier-Bresson, like Joel, and even like Winogrand in his, in his very different way, these guys are incredible athletes. <laughs> you know, no, they have true. reflexes, first of all, uh, visual reflexes and things like that, that any boxer or, or baseball player would give his eye teeth for. Um, but also their, their, their balance, their kind of balletic movement through the crowd, through whatever's going on, through what they want to photograph in a way that's extraordinary to stand back and watch, but which the subject is never intimidated or, or, or even is aware is happening. Again, with the exception of the kind of thing that Winogrand would sometimes do as an obverse uh, way of taking pictures. Um, so that whole aspect of it, of, of my awareness of what was going on with the photographer to get these pictures, uh, again, drew me into the subject of street photography. Not well, just the pictures, but what I was beginning to understand went into making them. Uh, one of the interesting things that you touched on, on in Bystanders was uh, the different communities that sort of were built around uh, street photography. There was a photo league in New York. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. then, then there was this whole collective of Arbus, Winogrand, Meyerowitz mm -hmm. uh, during the 60s and the 70s. And, and you also write about Magnum mm -hmm. in, more, right. in more recent years. How important were those respective communities in terms of developing a sort of a modern language for what street photography is and, and could be? I mean, they were very important. And another even more informal version of the same thing was that uh, Winogrand in the uh, 60s used to have a kind of um, uh, open forum for discussing street photography at his apartment. People would meet once a month or once a week. I don't remember exactly what it was. Todd Papa George was very crucial to that and helped him organize it. And then Joel came in a bit after Todd and a lot of other people. Uh, uh, went into that uh, 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 sort of thing too. So there was, even there you saw there was this need to have some kind of community for practical purposes because um, there were times when uh, uh, Joel and a British photographer named Tony Ray Jones went out on the street together at certain points. Joel went out with Gary and he went out with Todd at certain points. But as Joel liked to put it, there, were all, there was always on any day that you were out with other photographers or over the long course of going out sometimes with other photographers, there always came a point <clears throat> on a daily or sometimes a larger time scope, there always came a point where you said, I need to go my own way. I need to be alone out here to make my own pictures. He said sometimes he and Tony Ray Jones wound up making practically the same picture because their instincts were so similar. Tony Ray Jones was a wonderful photographer who unfortunately died young and is not that well known, but in street mm -hmm. photography we give him some due that he deserves. Um, so the, the, uh, the kind of collective, I mean Magnum got founded by Cartier-Bresson, uh, uh, Robert Kappa, and David Seymour who worked under the name of Chim. Uh, because they realized after the war that what they were doing uh, and the kind of stuff that Life magazine would buy from them was great, but that they needed to be free to be in the whole world. I mean, they realized that w out of World War One, out of World War Two rather, came one world in a sense. There'd never been one world before, at least for people who lived in the Western world, that they were going to be you know, in, in a post-colonial era, they were going to need to be all over the world. And, you know, two, within uh, less than a decade, two of the three founding members were dead. Uh, Seymour uh, died in 60, uh, I, maybe it was a decade later, I think he died in 67, in the, in the, uh, uh, Air, the Arab-Israeli War in 67. And Kappa stepped on a landmine in Indochina in 1954. Cartier-Bresson died when he was 96 in his own apartment. Um, but they were all over the place. So they needed a cooperative where the founding members and then other people who were brought in by election, so photographers of a certain level of talent and range in the kind of work they were going to be doing, could send back the pictures from wherever you were in the world and get them to Life magazine in, in time for timely publication. That was the whole idea of Magnum. So it was a really economic relationship, but also it, it became uh, a fellowship, uh, obviously, in certain ways. In the 30s, starting, of course, not only with the Photo League, but with the Farm Security Administration, there were these photographic projects because there were desperate times, America was in big financial trouble, and it was creating all kinds of social dislocation. And so the documentation of the impact of these hard times and the way that it was transforming society was something that got started through the FSA, the uh, Farm Security, the FSA program uh, uh, by the federal government with Roy Stryker in charge and he, Walker Evans and, and Dorothea Lang wound up photographing and all kinds of really wonderful people. Uh, ben Sean, who was already primarily a painter, did wonderful street photography, traveled off and on for years uh, with that project. And then the Photo League, which was uh, an organization just in New York, um, and uh, was, photo uh, was founded with a very liberal bias uh, of a certain kind, also provided a forum, again, where people could bring back their pictures and show them to each other, even though they went out mostly alone. Um. On the topic of, of the documentary aspect, uh -huh. um, sometimes it seems like street photography and documentary working sort of bleed into each other. Mm -hmm. 
Um, how do you distinguish between the kind of documentary style street photography and quote unquote straight street photography? Is there is there uh, a way that you sort of separate the two, or do you? I, I don't, in in a in a certain sense, separate them. I mean. The documentary project went into people's homes. It went a lot of places besides the street, some of them not public at all. But even in those situations, the kind of photographs uh, that were being made were ones that addressed everyday life. Even though the, the Farm Security Administration, the, the ultimate goal was to photograph the unique situation, the newsworthy situation in which ordinary people now found themselves. Um, what Stryker got back and very quickly realized was the core of the story were pictures of the way in which everyday life was itself being infiltrated by hard times, but not elementally changed. So life out on the street, life sometimes in more domestic environments or in more closer to the private lives of people, they had photographs of everyday life, not the Depression with a capital D and, and, you know, and Roosevelt speaking in the background, but the everyday life that people lived and how that was being altered, how they might talk about it or express it, and pictures of them doing so. Again, even when it was in a situation that wasn't the street, was one where they were invited into, there was a certain kind of thing, a certain kind of photograph that became newsworthy precisely because it wasn't made because it was an important event. It wasn't somebody shooting at somebody else or giving a, an important speech or anything like that. So the, the, the aesthetic inherent in street photography, which Cartier-Bresson had found his way to instinctively <coughs> when the camera first came into his hands, um, that idea of photography became part of photojournalism but not, again, not something that, that, um, that you could send someone to, a, to a, what they knew would be a newsworthy event. You see the distinction I'm making? Yeah, it's, yeah, a kind, it's a kind of messy one, but nevertheless, I think it exists. I think you can pull the aesthetic of street photography right out of all that work that was done. And, you know, Stryker wrote shooting scripts, which most of the best photographers threw away. But he had his own ideas of how you were right. going to make this newsworthy. And the photographers knew better than he did but that the way to make it newsworthy was not to do it as a formal you know, presentation photograph on an official occasion.